small intestinal bacterial overgrowth relapse. Why are you struggling with it and what can you do about it? Hi, I'm Dr. Arland Hill and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, what's often known as SIBO, is a very common condition. In fact, it's much more recognized than it used to be and we now appreciate that many individuals deal with this and deal with it on a repetitive basis. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's something that you can do about it. Now my guess is, is that if you're watching this video, you've probably tried your own approaches to SIBO. Maybe you've even sought out the help of other individuals, other professionals to deal with this and likely you've seen some success with that. But the problem is, is that, and this has been the case in my observation, is that within six months to 12 months, there seems to be a relapse. You're back to where you were. SIBO is often characterized by bloating, excess gas that tends to happen fairly frequently, often quickly after eating, even distension in the abdomen that can sometimes be accompanied by pain. So if you're seeing that and it begins to represent itself after being corrected, you have to begin to ask the question, well, why is that? It likely wasn't the fact that the antibiotic or the antimicrobial, botanical or herbal that you were placed on was wrong. In fact, that absolutely is necessary to have a good to deal effectively with SIBO. But there's another piece to this. That's only the first step of three that are essential to dealing with this and being able to prevent the relapses. When we talk about SIBO, we have to understand why it manifests in the first place. Well, if we think about the gastric, the stomach, the gastrointestinal tract and the stomach in the upper portion of the intestinal tract or gastrointestinal tract, and then we think about the small intestine. So we're in the upper area, stomach moving into the small intestine. These are fairly harsh areas. These are areas that we see secretion of acid in the stomach. We see secretion of enzymes and bile in the upper small intestine. And when there's breakdowns in, the secre in those secretions, when there's a limitation in the stimulus that allows those secretions to be released, that's when we begin to see problems. So we have to ask ourselves, why is the acid not being produced? Or what's limiting enzyme production or even bile? These are all well-known antimicrobials. Yes, they serve roles as digestive aids as our normal digestive secretions to help us break down our food and extract the most benefit out of it, but they're also antimicrobials. They serve a dual purpose of supporting digestion, but also helping defend us against an overgrowth of microorganisms. So when those systems break down, we get that overgrowth. Well, if we don't ask those questions of why you're deficient in those acid enzymes and bile, there's a strong likelihood that you're gonna to continue to develop SIBO on a repetitive basis. We need to replace those in the short term. We need to immediately fix where the breakdowns are at. And if we do that, then inherently, we can start to see some, some improvement and reduce the likelihood of a relapse. But that's only the second piece that we need to address. Remember, we needed to have an antimicrobial intervention, botanical, herbal, if you will, type of, type of intervention, we need to follow that with making sure that we have adequate digestive secretions and that we're breaking down our food as we should and rebuilding those defense lines. But again, there's a third component here that we need to address. And that third component is what I often look at as collateral damage. SIBO does not take place with, without some insult to our body. There are implications of SIBO being around, of it being present, for a period of time. The most well known of these deficient or most well known of this damage is going to be nutrient deficiencies. We see these both on a micronutrient level, meaning things like vitamins, minerals, and we also see these on a macronutrient level, meaning things like proteins. When we start to talk about some of these deficiencies, these are important simply because that if, if we don't address these deficiencies, then these deficiencies go on to lead to break, further breakdowns in our metabolism. And more importantly, and maybe as it more directly relates to our conversation today, they also directly affect the profiling of the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. 
Meaning that they, some of these nutrients, vitamin A, B12 as examples, are known to be the difference in whether or not the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract develop a healthy pro profile or whether they develop a profile that is more inflammatory, less optimal for long-term health. That's obviously not what we're looking for. And simply steering away from that means identifying what nutrient deficiencies have been allowed to manifest and simply going back and correcting those. Thinking about SIBO and thinking about relapses of SIBO and how you're going to offset that should be a three-prong approach. It's not a single-tier intervention. There's not going to be this simplicity of use the antimicrobial, change the diet, and things immediately resolve. It doesn't quite work that way. We do need to do those things. Dietary modification does have its place and it does make a difference. But we also need to address the dysfunction that ultimately allowed to the, for the onset of this anyway, of the SIBO in the first place. And we also need to address the, the dysfunction, the collateral damage again, if you will, that resulted as a byproduct of that, which again are nutrient deficiencies. So if you think if you're struggling with relapses, make sure you check off all three of those things and your outcomes will be, a, will be far improved. So with that said, I wanna thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I'm Dr. Arlen Hill, and I look forward to speaking with you again very soon.